So welcome to another video from theplayers8.com. My name's Alexander. And I'm Grant. And today, even though there's two of us, we're going to be talking about um, solitaire wargaming. Because I've tip I've done quite a lot of solitaire wargaming over my short wargaming career, and Grant's start getting more into starting it. to get more on that, and he's done a few recently. Um, so a few, probably, gee, it might have been about a year ago, I did a video on kind of introductory level wargaming, like solitaire war games, and kind of how to get into that if you're new. Today we're going to do a bit more of a general look. We're going to kind of talk about what makes a good solitaire game, and then we're going to take a look at more kind of the midweight and the heavier solo games that you'll kind of want to get your teeth into kind of further as you progress down that line. So, Brian, if you want to take it away with what do you yeah. think makes a good solitaire war game? Well, I think all of us have our own opinion. I think each of us will have different ideas about what makes great solitaire gaming. I always like to look... I'm, a, I'm a, a structured person, so I like a game that has a very solid sequence of play. One that you can follow very easily, and it's, it's somewhat repetitive because, let's face it, solitaire gaming is repetitive... As you're moving through a game. You want structured, right? Structure, yes. Not repetitive necessarily, but structure. Because, once again, I don't want it to be so complex I have to flip back to the rule book every single phase. So that's something I think makes a really good solitaire game. I also really, obviously a good AI, right? A good yeah. opponent. And it is impossible to replicate the craziness that swims around in Alexander's brain. So when I'm playing these war <laughs> games, I'm always waiting for that one move where I kind of scratch my head and go, huh. But that doesn't happen because Solitaire typically doesn't do it that way. But I like a good AI, a good AI that has intelligence, that makes decisions that simulate what a real life uh, player would be. And, and I think those decisions that it makes must make sense, I think, most importantly. Yeah, I'd yeah. agree with that. I, I want it to... It doesn't necessarily have to be amazingly realistic, because I well, just think can. that's very yeah. hard to do. Yeah. What I want is it to, for it to be clever. I want it to right. not be incredibly predictable, so, the, so it becomes yeah, gamey. Pre that's and the I thing I think that. I would have said. Predict, very predictable would be bad. Oh, I know what's going to happen. Although sometimes, and I'll talk a little bit about that in one of my games... That's kind of a neat element because you can see things building. Right, and there's and then there's the strategy to that. Right. But you don't you know You don't want to know, oh, it's gonna do this on turn two. Yeah. Or this on yeah. turn three. Yeah. yeah. No, you know that that's very good. You, point. Don't, you don't want to be able to just like oh, here's my power moves because I know yeah. what they're gonna do. To an extent, you'll be able to do that in a lot of solo games. Mm -hmm. Just because it's a solo game, you'll figure it out, you're smart. But you always want to have some element of surprise or some element of the unknown. Yeah. That really kind of keeps it tactically and strategically interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, no, I'd agree with that. For me, what I like in solitaire games, I like all those things. Um, a solitaire game, I want to, I want to feel something. Mm -hmm. To me, mm -hmm. I want to have a good feeling. I want the game to either have a great narrative and tell an excellent story that feels realistic or at least draws me into it, mm -hmm. or Kind of the total opposite of that, like playing, I played Unconditional Surrender um, solo. I want it to feel huge mm -hmm. and I want it to feel very powerful, like I'm like <laughs> the overlord moving the pieces sure, around, yeah. rewriting history. I want, I want to feel something. And a game, you know, the system does that, loosely, you know, that part of that is I allow myself to get into the game. But yeah. Some games are too, I don't know how, I, how I'd say that, but they're quite telegraphic where you're like, I'm just shuffling some pieces around. They don't give me that feeling when I'm playing it on my own. Yeah. We really need a live opponent to make this a, a, a good A good game. experience, yeah. yeah. No, I, I like the narrative as well. And In fact, a couple of the solitaire games I've played, one we're not going to be talking about today, but Merrill's Marauders. I really like that one. It's one of the small polybag games from Decision Games. There's about a dozen of them. I'd love to get them all. But it's it, it's really got some cool elements. You're like, oh boy, we just got ambushed in the middle of the jungle. And it's... You're like, how am I ever going to survive that? And it, it's tension, it's difficult, and it, and you start to care for those guys. And so I do. I like that in the narrative. And yeah, as well. That's something that I would say. Oh, although the examples that we're going to take a look at today might not, not support that. Games which are often on a very small scale, 
more tactical <clears throat> style games where you're working with individual like people or small squads. Yeah, na even named individuals. Sometimes. Usually, those give a really good story. It's yeah. easier to get a a good cool you know narrative, almost like I'm watching a TV show right. or or a movie. You get a good feeling out of those games because it's like, oh, this is like, yeah, you know, it's Le Lieutenant Smith and he's yeah. gonna jump in this building and do a thing, and we're gonna see what happens. Yeah. But sometimes when you're kind of at a higher level, like I've played a lot of games solo where it's just moving some regiments and divisions around. It's a little less personal. There's no connection. That way. Yeah, yeah, no personal. Connection. So I think I think having smaller level games mm -hmm. often is susceptible to having really cool narratives in, in a solo game. Yeah. So what we'll do, we'll kind of take a look. Again, if you want introductory games, check out the other video that I did. There's a lot of good advice. And there's a lot of other games that should be on that list that I've played since, but we'll kind of talk about some of those. So let's start with some of the simpler games just to kind of get you into it. Get started. Yeah, and this is one, uh, it's from High Flying Dice Games. This is called Depths of Courage. And there's a few in this series, and this is a very um, inexpensive game. I think it's what it's called, seven dollars. Seven ninety-five, I think. And this is kind of, it's almost like a print and play game. Just mm -hmm. cut out the little counters and you move them on a little map. What's neat about this is it's very, very short and it doesn't take up a lot of space. I played this at work on my lunch break. Yeah. It took me about twenty minutes to play from start to finish. Are you sure it was on your lunch break? <coughs> it was definitely on my lunch break. <laughs> um, but it's it's a really neat theme. This is about yeah. small little what do they call them? The pig, pig class, is that what? Yeah, the pig class submarines. Two man submarines, yeah, basically. Yeah, with two little Italian commandos on them. And this is, um, they were going in, trying to bomb um, British naval ships in, in the port of Gibraltar. And it, it's just a neat theme. Never played mm -hmm. a theme, anything like that before. And it's a very simple, there's not a lot of spaces on the board. You just kind of move in, drop your limpet mines, try and get out, and try and not get detected. It's very quick. Um, it uses this really cool um, card system where you have a deck of, not a, a full deck of cards, but you use a deck of cards as a number randomizer instead of chucking a bunch of dice. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really neat system, and, and that keeps it kind of small and quiet as well, so you can do it at your desk on your lunch break. <laughs> and th this is really fun. If this your is, boss is watching. This is a very, very uh, easy game to learn. The yeah. ru rules book is a rules page. It's two pages, yeah. and uh, this is very introductory. Pick this up if you're kind of new to the solo gaming. This is I recommend this, especially and, for the price. And this is one in a series. Actually, I think it's like seven or eight, which they haven't done necessarily seven or eight. There's a lot of two or three. titles out there that they haven't finished. But I, I, I really have been drawn to those because it's an odd, kind of off kilter subject yeah. that is really cool. And it's and it's quick. And yeah. it's unique. You're not investing three hours in this game. No. You're investing 15 minutes. So. And I've paid $7 for yeah. it. And you, Very cool. you play it a few times over a few years. You get your money's worth. Yeah. But that's that's a kind of a quick little introductory style game. Do you have any others down there? Um, well, Rifles in the Ardennes yeah, this is, is, a great is one. one that... Uh, this is from Tiny Battle Publishing. We actually played this for the first time together, ironically. We played a solo game together. And then you've played it since then mm -hmm. and, and done a review. But it's a it, it's kind of different than normal solo games because it's it's a it's not a map. You're not putting units on a map, you're putting units on a card that has a level kind of levels on it that you're trying to advance through. Kind of reminds me of upfront. Yeah. A, a little bit where you're going from far away to close up. Yeah, the map itself is abstract. Let's see if I can dig it out. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting concept, and I thought the designer did a really good job with and it, it. And it, it also keeps the table space down. This is yeah. the map. And that might seem incredibly boring. It's weird. But you have a bunch of terrain counters that you put yeah. on and different cover markers and you move your dudes up and down depending on what your mission is. Very, yeah. very quick and easy to learn. Again, a small rule book. Yeah. But this is a squad level game. You have a squad and it might have three or four guys in it in two teams and you're just trying to progress through and do your mission. Um, and get to the end and succeed and live. Basically. And there's, I think there's eight missions. Yep. And you can play it with three different factions: uh, Russians, 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 Germans, Germans and Americans. Yeah. And so you get a lot of play out of this. Again, a very inexpensive game. This one was a quick one to learn as well. Yeah. The, the other thing I liked about this is it, there was some customization. Yeah. So you could decide what. Did you actually were you able to get grenades or? Yeah. You. So you were able to add different heavy weapons. And it just, it, it was kind of cool because you could try different things out. Oh, I used three grenades last time. Let's only do two. 
and let's do something else. I, I thought that was kind of Yeah, neat. like to missions like, hey, you're going to mm -hmm. go and try and take out a tank. So you're like, oh. I need a bazooka. You basically have a point buy system. I'm going to buy this yeah. guy, this guy, this guy, and we're going to get a bazooka, and we're going to get, you know, or you can buy your own tank. You could take a light tank. Right, there were tanks the in tank, there. It's like all your points, you've got a yeah. tank and a man, you're like, but yeah, this is a this is a little uh, power game in a bag. I had a really yeah. good time playing this, and we're going to talk about Fields of Fire later. This to me felt very similar. This is like Fields of Fire light, because Fields of Fire is very very complex, mm -hmm. and this is very much not that case. But there's some similarities in the way it plays, and and the kind of the same story that it tells. And it's kind of a World War Two tactical game. Yep. It's called Rifles in the Ardennes, but. It's quite a generic system. It's really system. World War II. Yeah, there's nothing like, yeah. Arden about it. Yeah. Yeah, I remember thinking, oh, this is a bulge game. No, it's not. No, a bulge it is game not. This is all. a tactical yeah. war game. Really, really fun. With just different scenarios. There's, like I said, eight of them. So lots of options, some replayability there because there's three factions. Very yeah. simple, good price point. I think it was 20 some bucks. It's, yeah, this is, a, this is a great value, yeah. and the counters are great, artworks, good quality as well. So, yeah, neat little game. And like we said, that's a, a, one of those tactical games that tells a good story. Yeah. It might not be quite as maybe uh, rich and in-depth. You don't like necessarily go and name your dudes. You mm. can do that if you want to. You can put as much into it as you want. But um, a fun story, fun system, mm. and, it, and it plays quickly as well. Now I think next on the docket, we have this is my target for today. And if a lot of people out there have played B-17 Queen of the Skies, old, old Avalon Hill game, one of the kind of first solo war games. And this is basically the newest iteration of that. You're flying um, B-17s amongst other planes and you have a roster of kind of all of the crew of your B-17s and you literally name them. Here's their position. They're the kind of the ball gunner, they're the right tail gunner, they're this, that, or the other, the pilot, co-pilot, navigator, the bombardier. And you, have, you will just fly missions Target for today is chuck some dice, look on a chart. Bremen. This is where we're going. Yeah. And you have to fly through X amount of zones, and you as you progress through the zones, you'll see if you get attacked by fighters or flak, all those kind of things. And you, you will die a lot. <laughs> you'll you'll take extremely heavy losses, as kind of it was in the Eighth Air Force and Bomber Command. But basically you flip through a book of charts. And you roll on the charts and tables and see what happens. Uh, this is a game where maybe there's not as much tactical decision making to be made. Um, in fact, there's probably very little. Um, there's, there's two or three decisions that you would make when you get attacked by a fighter from like three o'clock. Do I kind of move a crew member over if possible? You know, when my crew members start dying, do I move them to the other side of the plane to kind of man this side? And where you are in the formation might make that decision easier for you. You know, all these planes have gone down, so we've got to protect this kind of side mm -hmm. of it more. But this is a this is very much a story game. The, the, the game is, I chuck dice, we see what happens, and it tells a narrative. And you're kind of along for the ride. You have some control, but really not, not as much as in some of the other games that we're going to talk about today. So this is still quite an introductory game, but it can be quite, this is very heavy. There is a lot, lot in this. Lots of stuff in there. A lot of planes you can fly, a lot of missions. The, the amount of missions in this is historically accurate. It's exhaustive. The, the gazetteer that you fly missions to, huge. So you could get endless plays out of this game. And never play the same thing twice. Yeah, honestly. And even if you did, the same thing would never happen. It right. would always be different just because of how much dice rolling and kind of randomness happens. Th there's a guy on Twitter, and I cannot remember the, the, the handle, but he was literally running through like a mission a day, you know, target for today and, and doing four or five tweets explaining how it worked. And I was like, yeah, that looks so fun. And yeah. that was just after it came out. And I know that you've enjoyed it. And but what I like about this game. is the detail in it. You, you know, it's not just, I roll mm -hmm. some dice, you get shot down. Well, that's just not how it is. Mm -hmm. You know, you roll dice, you might take a hit. So then you roll more dice to see where you get hit on the plane. And then you roll dice to see what happens to that part of the plane that got hit. And then, does it catch on fire? Does yeah. it blow up? Yeah. And then if it does catch on fire, well, where are my fire extinguishers? Where did I put them in my mm. plane? Because i got to send crew members to go get them and put the fire out. And whilst they're doing that, they're not firing their gun to protect that right. part of our. So, so you get some really de cool decision making in there. But it's the detail that this game tells you that really brings alive the memory of what actually happened in these. And that's what's neat about this game. Is, is it, to me, it kind of sucks you in, historically speaking. 
There's another game by Legion that I really want to get a copy of. It's the second edition of Picket Duty that came out, I think, in 2013, 2012, 2013. But it, it's similar to that because you're, you're defending a destroyer and you have the same thing. This side gets it. You have to run over and put that fire yeah, out. Yeah, kamikaze planes are coming yeah. and you're trying to shoot them down. Really cool. And then you get hit and it's... That's one I want to play. Around. But that's so. target for today from Legion War Games. Again, this is... Uh, most people, anyone could pick this up and play that. Not necessarily a very complex game, but it tells a great story. Yeah. Um, in a similar vein, we have A Wing and a Prayer, which it might look like it's the same theme, <laughs> and that's because it is. Uh, but this is from uh, Lock and Load Publishing, and this game, it's B-17s, and you're doing the same missions. You've got all the missions that you fly in the cards. But what's cool about this one is it's kind of a step back. Where in Target for today, you're flying an individual plane, and you're, you're manning the crew, and each of your crew has a name. Uh, this, you're flying an entire formation. So you've got, um, I think, how many planes can we go up to? I want to say it's like 12. You have 12 planes, and you fly a full formation. Of course, I can't find it. There it is. So you have this formation board, and you have counters, and you'll have... You know, your lead element, you have high element, low element, and your tail element, and you'll have 12 plane, or up to 12, and you have plane counters, and each of those plane counters has a crew counter that is named. So you, you can fly the Memphis Bell, that counter is in this game, so you can, you cool. can do yeah. that. Um, so, and big, beautiful counters, too, those are yeah, huge. Yeah, it's fantastic artwork in this game. And it's a very similar feel, where you're flying the missions, you move along on a board, You'll get attacked by some fighters and, and the combat, you resolve the combat, not in the same way, but you know, it's, they come in, they roll some hits, who do you assign them to, you chuck some dice and find out kind of thing. But it's just kind of a step back, so there's a bit more of this kind of organizing a whole formation and keeping them together, not getting lost in bad weather or in heavy flak. If you start taking hits, your planes start to lag and get out of formation, so you get into some very interesting things. You drop your bombs. And that's really cool. The bomb resolution's fun based on how tight your formation was and everything that happened. So a similar themed game, but plays very differently. This is a wing and a prayer. I had a really good time playing this. And I haven't played that yet. Yeah, so. This one had a, had cool artwork. Uh, and it's, you know, it scratches that same itch if you had to buy one or the other. It's a purely preference. I'm lucky enough to have both. I really enjoyed this one. I think we have... Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll do a little more, uh, once again, a game from Tiny Battle Publishing. This is not necessarily complex. This is... But it does have some complexity to it. I did a video on this one a couple of weeks ago, a series of action points as well. But this game is Attack of the 50-Foot Colossi, which is the third game in the Invaders from Dimension X series designed by Herman Lutman. And this is a solo-only game. You are playing a uh, galactic marine division who's actually on R&R, &R, and they get called in because some miners are being attacked on this planet. And you go down, and it's a hex encounter game, and it tells you where you start out. There's two scenarios. And what you're doing is you're controlling the stacks of counters that represent the enemy, or the colossi, and you're moving around the board with some rolls, and they have a lot of really cool abilities. One of them might throw rocks at you. Another one may dig itself in the ground and pop up on the other side of the map or at, at an objective hex. So there's a lot of variability there. But the AI is really cool because it's very random. And I enjoyed that because that's what this game is about. This game is not a structured game. You, you want some craziness. You, you want to be running around and have a guy pop up next to you and have to fight him. Um, but you have objectives. You have to go through it. And the thing I really liked about it is it didn't necessarily have the narrative because none of the guys are named. There was one guy that was named. But you, you really had to think about how to use each of the different types of units to better attack the monsters. And I found that to be very challenging and very fun and very rewarding when you finally did the right things and were able to really hurt that stack because they were very, very powerful. But it has a lot of really neat mechanics in it, a lot, of, a lot of variability, and really tells kind of a fun, neat story. And like I said, there's two scenarios, so you, you have a lot of replayability because each of them are going to be different. I would give this one a try just because it's a simple, I think it's a $20 game. Um, you can play it in about an hour and a half, and it, it 
Doesn't tell a great story, but it's fun. Well, it's I, random. What I like is the how clever the Colossi themselves are. Yeah. Where it's a stack of counters, and yeah. that represents kind of one monster. Yeah. But and, and as you attack it, it, it gets yep. smaller and smaller and smaller. Yep. I think that's just a neat little. You have this big stack yeah. around the board, yeah. and as you attack it, it gets smaller and smaller. I think that's cool. Just yeah. a fun little mechanic in there. And, and and also as they get smaller and smaller, some of their abilities change, which makes it even more. And you don't know what's next. You're not allowed to examine the stack. So when you kill that top, you'd be like, "Oh yeah, I killed the top thing," but oh no, <laughs> the next the next thing's special ability is way worse. So then you had to fight through that. Yeah, and, and the other thing I liked about it was the AI system was very well done. There are, I think there are six tribes. And on those cards, there are seven tribes. On those cards, they only list, I think there are five of the, the, the tribes listed on the card. So when you pull a card out, it's going to activate only the tribes that are listed. So you might get lucky sometimes and only three of those five cards or tribes are on the board. So you might be like, oh, I'm able to get a breath. And then the next round, you pull the card, and it's like every single one of those is on the board, and they're all coming after you. So I really liked that because there was some randomness that gave you a breath. There was some really tough times. But, yeah, really well put together game I, from Herman Lutman. I really enjoyed this one. So check it out, Attack of the 50-Foot Colossi. Kind of a silly game, but, hey, it's great. I think what we'll take a look at next is I've got a couple games. These are both from DVG. So... We'll start with Thunderbolt Apache Leader, because in the previous video we talked about Phantom Leader, and that's um, quite easy to get into just because you've got you know a series of planes and you arm them with weapons, and the tactical resolution is quite simple. Um, the board isn't massively complex, you've got bad guys, you get enemy planes, you can kind of figure it out. Thunderbolt Apache Leader is a bit of a step up from that. Um, and there's a lot of games that fit this, and I think we'll talk about Sherman Leader here yeah. in a second. The, the tactical resolution of this game is kind of a full board with terrain hexes, and there's a lot more guys out, and, and they can move around and do different things. And what's neat about this game is you have like one or two planes. Like, it's not a lot. I felt like in, in, in uh, Phantom Leader, you have a flight of five or six guys, you go in, you drop a bunch of payloads, mm. it's really fun. This, you've got one or two, and you've got to move around the whole board very strategically, um, you know, controlling your altitude, how you go over and under, you kind of go over ridges mm. and cliffs, because if you fly low enough, you'll get enemies that pop up and can surprise attack you that you didn't know were on the board. So you have to be... It's a, it's a, it involves a little bit more thought in the presentation of that, because there's stuff that you don't know. Um, and there's, you know, there's the same kind of making my loadout, the, the preparation for these missions is very important, but I felt like the actual tactical execution um, gave me a more decision-making mm -hmm. than something like um, Phantom Leader did. So th this is kind of just a step up from that. Uh, I highly recommend this. I think this is one of the very popular ones from their life. People love this game. And, I and that came why. after Phantom Leader, right? Yeah, yeah. This is one of the... It's 2012. Okay. But yeah, that's a really fun game. Uh, this is Field Commander Napoleon. This game is huge. The box is massive. There's a uh, lot of counters in there. Yeah. They did a video of this one on its own. And it's just really good. Um, this could be one that you learned... It says it's low to moderate complexity on it. If you were new to solo gaming, you could pick this up. You could pick this up. It's not necessarily the most complex, but there's a few different nuances to the combat and, and how to execute that and execute it well. I think that's where I'd say, you know, it takes a bit more complexity. Is you know, how, Do I put my troops in a line formation or do I put them kind of in a marching formation? Do I, you know... Do I, how far do I charge my cavalry up? There's, there's a lot of different Napoleonic concepts you kind of got to get your mind around. Um, but this one is, it's not overly complex, but I'm glad that I waited to play it where I feel like I can get into the meat of the game, mm -hmm. having played a lot of others kind of easier to learn solo and war games. Like, I've got some tactics in my mind of how to approach this. And this game is huge. Um, you, there's a ton of campaigns in here. I've got so much game in here. I mean, I don't know what to do with myself, basically. I really enjoyed month. this. If you can pick this up for a good I highly recommend this And one. you got this at Gen Con yeah, and I got last it, year. And this, I got it on a ding and dent sale. It, yeah. 
and it uh, it was like thirty dollars. It was a bit more than that, maybe, but I got it was a steal. It yeah. was an absolute steal. I remember you were excited when we were in uh, yeah, in that I, area. You were like, "Oh, I'm I, getting it!" I like, like saw wow. it. That's the first time I've seen it in person. Yeah, and then I saw the price, and I was like, "Oh, I have to get, yeah, it. have to get it." And yeah. uh, well, well worth it. I highly recommend that game. So, so staying with uh, with DVG. Staying with DVG, this is their newest game. Uh, just came out on Kickstarter earlier this year. Sherman Leader, which is a ground combat game in World War II. The game that you just talked about, Apache Leader and Phantom Leader, are air war. Yeah. So you're working helicopters and airplanes and etc. This one is tanks, vehicles, uh, infantrymen, and you're fighting either the, the Germans or the Japanese in World War II. There are nine different campaigns with about six or seven objectives with each of those campaigns. So your, your options, so you have nine campaigns with these six objectives. You can make a ton of combinations. So there's a lot of ability to play a lot of different elements about World War II from the Normandy landings all the way through Saipan uh, and some of the Pacific Theater War. But once again, you're controlling an American uh, division of vehicles and infantry. The thing I really like about this game, there's two things I really enjoy about the game, and Alexander talked about it in the previous. You have to build your team. You have a certain amount of points. Yeah. You have to buy a, a good combination of infantry teams, both green infantry teams and elite. You also have to buy some different types of vehicles. You always want Sherman tanks. You always want something good that has some power. But, you know, the reality is it's very tough to decide because you don't have enough points. I think the most points I had was in the first campaign. I had like 110, and I thought, yippee, this is going to be easy. I laid out like 50 cards I wanted. And, and you have to cut it down to about 12 units, and it's just very hard. But you have to have a good selection of those because you're going to fight really infantry heavy, heavy uh, battalions with from the Germans, but some of those may have a lot of tanks in them, and if you don't have the firepower, you're never going to win. The game is set up so that over a campaign, you're going to, you're going to pay, play somewhere between three and eight weeks. And during each of those three to eight week parts of that campaign, you're going to have two to three battles per week in order to do well. And during those battles, you're going to get wounded. You're going to get stressed out. Your commanders are going to get stress tokens. And guess what? They cannot fight week after week. They can't do it. And I think Phantom Leaders yeah, uh, like all, that as well. All, the games all of them that, like yeah. that. And man, that was something I really struggled with my first play. I thought to myself, how the hell am I going to get these guys <laughs> ready to go again? And I've only got like three points a week to do it. So you have to give some R&R. &R. Sometimes you have to just go into a battle understanding I don't have enough guys to really destroy them, but try to do what you can. So I really liked that element of it. So the, the, the other really cool part I liked about this was the damage resolution part of the game. You have a, a blind chit draw cup where you have 56 different chits in that cup. And they're double-sided. So one side is made for your infantry hits or, or your, or your armor-piercing hits or your, for your vehicle. So you're going to reach in and draw one of those out. And if your man got hit, you're going to flip it to, the, to their side. And they're going to take a wound. They're going to get stressed out. They're going to get suppressed. But sometimes they're going to get mowed down. I hate that counter, by the way, the mowed down counter. There are three of them, I think, out of the 56. So you can see they're not really prevalent. But I swear to you, I, I draw them all the time. I, yeah. I seem to draw them all the time. But when you draw that mowed down counter, it's going to totally destroy your unit and its commander. So you're going to lose that team. And I'll tell you what, it, it hurts. It hurts in the game because you, you don't have that power anymore. But it also hurts because those commanders, you, you've grown with those commanders. Some of those commanders you've taken from when they were rookies. And now they're skilled or veteran and they're doing some really cool things. And you're like... Damn, now I gotta start over, and it so it, it hurts. It does. It does. I mean, there, there and were. That's, the, that's what you want in a solo yeah, game, right? Yeah. It's that level of connection to story. They actually care about it. Now, if they weren't named, maybe I wouldn't care about it as much. But they actually have names. And it it's, did. You it's did. really cool. Um, but that damage resolution system is really neat. You don't get to remove those damage counters unless you have abilities or you pay points. So those damage counters can carry over from round to round. And if you take like two suspension hits on your tank, guess what? You can't fight. You can't move. If you take two hits on your machine gun, 
you can't attack troops anymore. I mean, it's just, it's really interesting the way that does it. This game is really cool. I liked it also because you can play a 30 to 40 minute mission and you can go do something else and come back the next day because it, it's that way. It's set up that way that you can finish that part and then you can come back and finish the game. So I really liked it. Lots of flexibility, lots of really cool units. Uh, my Sherman tanks were awesome. I never fought a King Tiger yet. They've been in some of my, but I haven't pulled one of those out to fight. Those things are scary. Yep. Um, lots of Panzer threes, Panzer fours, which, eh, they're scary, but I can take them out. Uh, but the, the great little game. I really enjoyed it. I'll be doing a uh, more thorough review of this over the next month or so. But uh, Sherman Leader from Dan Verson Games. I, I really liked it. Another one in their Leader series. I think we have, so I've got Enemy Coast Ahead, and this is the Doolittle Raid. I know in the previous video we talked a little bit about um, the Dam Buster Raid, and that's, I, I recommended that as a, as, as a kind of a more introductory game, specifically because the way that that game is, is in this one's the same way, is you start with executing a bombing run. And the bombing run in, in, in the Dam Buster Raid is very cool, and also not overly complex. You follow a flowchart, literally the flowchart tells you all the rules on what to do. It's very, very simple, and it's move, 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 adjust, 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 my height and altitude, speed and altitude, uh, and then I release my bomb when I think it's appropriate, chuck some dice, did I hit, right? Very simple, but you've got a bunch of planes doing that and you're trying not to get hit by flak. So that's quite kind of introductory, but the game gets really big the further, the longer you play it, because you take a step back, and then it's the flight towards the dams to do the dam raid. And then you take a step back, and it's the training flights mm -hmm. before we do that, and then it's, the, you know, so the game gets really big. This follows the same suit, but I would say that this is a little bit more complex, uh, just because the, the mission execution uh, isn't maybe as scripted. And I say scripted in the sense that the dam busters, here's the, the murder dam, there are two boxes, you move box, box, drop my bomb, fly away. Like, that's kind of, it's like a track that you move mm -hmm. your guys across. In, in, uh, in a Doolittle raid, you're just, you're just bombing Tokyo, basically. And so, the, the, it has an, kind of an open map with different regions, and there's a daytime and a nighttime. And so, you can, you can choose. You can fly around, it's a lot more open-ended. Move around, there's a bunch of different things that can happen that are bad but you're picking your target that you want to go to specifically. So there's a bit more, um, I would say Choice. there's a lot more tactics and strategy to the actual kind of bombing resolution. And I thought this was very rewarding. I actually really liked this. I would say I, I actually enjoyed the mission resolution more than I did the other one. Although I liked the theme of the other one. And that's because I'm biased. Because I'm English. <laughs> but this is... Um, this is a bit of a step up in the complexity, especially the, the bigger you make the game. If you start from like day one, I mean, you're, you've got to recruit your guys, you've got to train them, you're trying to give them skills so that when they execute the mission it's better, you're trying to avoid enemy espionage, you're trying to control, what well, control, but like you've got to roll for the weather. Then in this, you've got to, you've got to get your fleet together You've got to sail your fleet secretly to Japan and then launch the raid. Then you've got to fly there. Then you've got to do the bomber. So it, there's a lot, a lot more complex. to this. The other one, you just you do that, but it's flying from England to your know, location. There's stuff that can happen. There's just a lot more steps, and this is more to it. There's more meat in this game, but this is really cool. And I know they've got more coming. I believe there's going to be a Pearl Harbor one, which Ooh. I'm very excited for. Yeah. Very fascinating. But yeah, this is the. Yeah, Jerry White's a good designer too. I think he does a great job of it, including a lot of historical detail yeah. into the games and the little things that someone who cares about a subject is going to include as opposed to someone who's just really making a game. And what's nice is, mm -hmm. as complex as this game is, and it can be complex on the GMT arbitrary complexity scale, it's <laughs> a six. Um, but there are great play aids in this. So if you so it's not as complex as that number would no, say. No, I don't. Because you can follow it. Or I think that number might bring it down. It might be more complex. Yeah. If you just read the rule book, the rule book's pretty thick. But you just follow the play aids. Here's what I'm doing. Boom, 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 boom. And it gives you everything that you need to do and the rules or a reference to the rules of how to do it. So it, it can be very simple that way. Uh, but this is Doolittle Raid. This is a, a more complex game. We kind of get into the meat of the solo games. I really enjoyed this. Again, a very personal game. 
you've got your counters for the um, the Mitchell bombers, and each one of them has like a, a pilot that's named, and you've grown with him training him, and you've given, mm. he's gained some special abilities, and one time kind of things that he can use, and those are really cool too. So that's one that tells a good story. I feel like half of my games are uh, air war games. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of air war games, that's for sure. <laughs> so let's take a, take um, a tangent. Well, speaking of air war games, why don't you go ahead and talk about REF? This is one that came up in the previous video, and I put it on there because the the play aids are quite good. You can sit through and it's just step by step, da 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 da. Like but this is a earlier, complex game. There is there's good structure to it, yeah, so you yeah. could pick it up. But it is this is more complex. Just there's quite a few rules to go through. And this is a game that you can sit down and play. There is two player variant. We've played that together, which is fun. But either way, you play this, you want to play the full campaign. Uh, playing just a session of this, where it's just we play a whole day and I play against you, um, that's fine. It's an interesting game. But this game is the balance of the game is over the full campaign to me because the British right. are just hanging on for a lot of the game, trying to build up their reserve of planes, trying to get more pilots in that are healthy and that can actually fight. And then it comes, there kind of comes a point where the the German losses meet the kind of the RAF building up and then, and then it's a swing in momentum and it's just fascinating to see over the course of, I mean, it, it, it goes over a couple months and I think you, you don't play every day, but I probably played 15 or 20 days worth because I would roll, my, mm -hmm. the time progresses on a die roll. So you either move like one day, or you could move like five days. Right. And I swear I rolled like two days every time. So I play like the maximum <laughs> So you had to do a lot days. more battling. <laughs> so, but this is really cool. Um, so I, I do, this is kind of that middle ground. I would say this is a mid-weight game. If you, if you were like feeling adventurous and you wanted to do introductory level and you just wanted to jump into this, you could do it. Um, but... I, I, this is one of my favorite games, and I, I think, and, and I really it liked it itself. when we when we played the two player game. The map is very interesting. It's yes. a it's a map of of really lower England, mm -hmm. and it's it's like a circle, right? There's circles around it, and those are the attack vectors for the German invaders. Yeah, and and I remember I was the the British, and it was very cool trying to really spread out my very scarce resources. Yeah. To, to make sure I had enough in certain areas to be able to fend off those attacks. And, and that was really challenging, and I, I really enjoyed that. And when I guessed right, I was like, ah, oh, yeah, I did it right. It's just really hard to do. Yeah, it's very hard to do. And yeah. we played that one day, and I think I fought off like three waves, and it yeah, was, it was hard. Waves. It and was when, hard. And when you play solo... It, the, so this is what I was meaning, the, the circle. The Germans kind of build, it's kind of random on a card draw, and the card system is really cool. The Germans have a bunch of different planes from the different kind of Luftflotters, and they that you say, okay, this this Luftflotter is going to attack. Here's where they're going to attack. Here's what they're going to attack with, and you just build it out of all the counters you can, and then they 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 try and go there. And before <clears throat> that happens, you have distributed your forces. Mm -hmm. You've literally your flying sorties. You've got guys on standby. Yeah, okay, you got guys on best. patrols. Different, different airfields where they can attack certain areas. And hopefully you can kind of scramble yeah. them over depending on how much warning you have based on radar and the weather. And that was the other thing I liked because I I knew that you would be trying to take out like some of the radar because those gave me big advantages yep. to knowing. So I knew that you're, you would be a, now during the solitaire. How does that work though? Entirely it, random. So it, it, could, it could really... Be very, surprising. Very difficult. Probably to more difficult. Very, very difficult to bring. But lots of really neat elements in this one. I, I actually would love to sit down and play this one two player and play like a full campaign. Yeah, full campaign. And it's it, very you know, neat little game. You feel like it's just this tower defense that's going so hard. Exactly. And then yeah. eventually it turns. Well, and, and just like you said, attrition. You know, the German numbers are high yeah. here and the British numbers, and, and they kind of keep meeting. And once you get to that point where the, Ger the Germans have less planes than the British, you're yeah. like, Oh, I can breathe. And it is but so it's hard, hard to, to get, get there. To that point. Yeah, oh my gosh. Very hard. Like I won my campaign I played solo and I won it on like this like the last day. The second to last day is when I was like, oh, Yeah. I have <laughs> I, I have like zero victory points now. I didn't make it the whole game. <laughs> yeah. I kinda of won it on the last day. But that's a very well made game. It's yeah. decision games, right? Um, that, yeah, this RAF? this edition is yeah. put out by decision, yeah. yeah. And Great game. And it's a, a big game, but and this is one that it's not it's not a particularly personal game. 
the narrative yeah. comes from the overarching campaign. And I love Battle of Britain, one of my favorite movies. This is that movie in a box. Yeah. And you play it start to finish, and I feel like, you know, it is, it's so cool. Yeah. I feel like I'm the air marshal and I've like done it and I yeah. say like that's one of the few games where I've felt like supremely triumphant. And all the games like we play and it's like, oh yeah, I won, that's great. Yeah. This one, this story, I was getting hammered so hard the whole game. And at the end of it I was I won. I was I like, won. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. But once again, that's that's what makes a great solo game, it, right? It, is it having really, that feeling really, really of is. exultant victory. You know, I won, I can't believe it, I won. Uh, yes. Let's see. This is once again, another Air War game. This is... Uh, I, I told you we'd like the Air War games. I love them. And that's... So this is where there is Discord. Uh, a few things about this game. Totally super out of print. Not going to find it. And we'll probably never go back in print. And that's just kind of a, a thing that we're at. Uh, I got this in a trade. I was very lucky. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of beat up just because it's old. This is a huge box. And this is the Falklands. And basically what this game is... Is it's your your sailing kind of the fleet down to the Falklands to go and kind of liberate them from the Argentinians, and a lot of it is you've got the fleet and you're running Harrier patrols to defend them from incoming Exocet missiles and sorties from the Argentinian coast, and then there there is a, a landing phase that's somewhat abstract. You know you've got your troop carriers and you're trying to just dump them off and you roll a few battles, but that's that's more abstract. This is much more about the aircraft carriers and the air-to-air -air combat and then there's Argentinian subs trying to penetrate and, and there's some surface combat as well. This game is huge and by that I mean the size is unbelievably massive. Well, the, the map is also just, it's like yeah, it's huge and you only use this much of it, right? It's crazy. It's so, so, much, <laughs> so much of it is like, okay. Yeah, it's kind of, but it's a neat little looking it's game. It really is. It's massive in size, the counters are huge, the rule book is um, quite dense. It's thick, there's a lot in there, and that's why I think this is a more kind of a moderate to heavy solitaire game, just because there's a lot there. And it, trying to crunch through the rules and get it played, it's a big one. If you can find it, I do recommend it, especially because it's a fairly unique theme. There's not a lot of Falklands games out there, and this is this is a big one. Uh, I do recommend this. I did a big long video about this one. And so, a review, written review as well. Yeah, so check this one out if you can, and if you have interest. Or if you know someone that's got it, ask to borrow to get this one. This is a good kind of midway solo game. In a huge box. Massive. I got Massive that on top of my shelf. Um, I'll go ahead and talk about this one. I really like these games. Uh, you have D-Day... D-Day at Omaha. At Omaha. So this is D-Day at Tarawa. This is also from Decision Games. This is a John Butterfield design. A, a really... Interesting, I use that word seriously, a very interesting solitaire system. This is one of the first solitaire games that I bought and one of the first that I played. And it's, I think it's really well designed. I, I did want to show you the map because I, I think the map is the most amazing part of this game. But basically what this game is, is you are doing wave after wave of amphibious landing craft called LVTs, who are trying to land on this little, little piece of sand in the Pacific called Tarawa. Um, you can see the map has all these different colors on it, these different uh, zones and, and colors. Those colors represent fields of fire. And all of the games in this system, D-Day at Peleliu, D-Day at Tarawa, and, and at Omaha Beach, use this system so you're moving units in, and I just find it so fascinating that you're going you're gonna to look at colors of triangles, and then you're going to draw these cards, where did I put the cards, that tell you what groups are firing, what groups are not firing. So you may have a, a group of Marines right here, and you may never get fired on because guess what? The, the card wasn't drawn. And it, it's just a really well put together system that keeps you involved but it's also extremely impossible to predict. Yeah. You cannot predict this. The other cool thing I liked about it, and, and actually I don't know how realistic it is, but if you were in the fields of fire of three different colors, you're only going to get hit by one color. So it made it a little less realistic maybe, but it made it functional so that you can actually move the game Yeah, forward. you'd never win otherwise. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were times where I, I would get obliterated if all three of those attacks had gone through. But it's really cool because your landing craft are going to pull cards... And these multi-use cards are really neat 
They have actually three or four different parts. When you use them for the landing craft, you're going to draw it, you're going to look at the top, and it's going to tell you you made it all the way into the beach, or you drifted, or you got shot down, or you took damage. So then you're going to track those throughout the game, and guess what? There may come a point where you run out of LVTs, and you can, you're basically then wading into the beach, because there's like a coral reef out here. Um, really neat element. Then the combat is a very interesting system with the card draws. There's also a lot of melee. We love melee. The melee is very brutal. Each side's going to get a certain number of cards dealt to them based on their powers, whether they're elite. And then you're going to literally play war with those cards, with the solo bots. You're going to flip over the solos card, you're going to flip your card, and you're going to determine whether you hit or they hit. Very cool system, very simple. I, I've played this three times, I've yet to win. I'm going to be completely and that's honest. That's a theme. That's a theme yeah, with it, these games. It is games. not very difficult. one that you're going to win often. I've watched many videos, and the guys always say, hey, I made it to mid-game, and I was okay. And you're like, damn, I'm going to put hours into this and only make it. But it's, it's really cool. To me, it never gets old. I've played it three times. I'd love to play it again now. In fact, I make it home this weekend. And as difficult as it open. is, it's still rewarding though, right? Oh, it's extremely you're not just like, rewarding. This is stupid. This is too hard. Right. Like, you're like, you, <laughs> well, and you're trying to make decisions about where you're going because there's different the other cool thing is your different units have different abilities. Some have machine guns, some have grenades or bazookas, some have flamethrowers. So you know on the map what targets need what types. So you're trying to match those up too, so there's a lot of really great choices. And then guess what? A tank will then appear. You can see there's tank symbols on here. And once those tanks come out, you're kind of running around just trying to get out of their way, frankly. Um, but yeah, it's very rewarding. There's lots of choices, I think. There's a lot of randomness with the card draws. But the card deck, the deck isn't that thick. And you draw, like, almost the entire deck each round. And that's for the AI. Like, you yes. have great decisions. Yeah, right? you make all the decisions. Yes. Doing your stuff. The that's AI is, is decided about where it fires, when it fires, what groups fire, and that's where the cards uh, come in. Thanks for clarifying And this is a that. similar system, I believe, I don't know if this is true, to um, his latest game, which was um, Enemy Action Arden. Oh, okay. It has a similar type of... I looked at the board and it's got a billion different colored dots on it. So I yeah. think it uses a similar, similar type of activation system with the color. And it's very clever. You well, I can see why it you're works like, well. Well, the first time you see yeah. one of these maps, you're like, okay, what is this? But yeah. once, you, once you play, you're like, oh, this is genius. It's, it's incredibly clever. And, and you can see this map's not very big. The island's not very big. But I, I can tell you it's very hard to, very hard to do well. And the, the couple times I've done well... I. Just like you said, it's like exultant victory. Hey, I, I got five or six hexes into the island. Man, I did really well. well I didn't really win, but <laughs> you did I feel like I, I did well. <laughs> um, just a really neat system. I, I like it a lot. I enjoy the, the colors. I enjoy a little bit of the randomness. Um, and and it's, I think it's a well-put-together system by John Butterfield. Uh, if you have a chance to get one of these three copies, have you played... I played, I played Omaha, yeah. I, I'd like to get Brutal. I'd like to get Pele Lou just to, just to have it as a follow-up and a comparison. I know they've made some changes to the system. But, uh, yeah, this is uh, D-Day at Terawa, one square mile of hell is what they referred to this battle as. And it, it really is, to be honest. And he did a good job of, of doing that. So, great game. A little bit expensive, though. I think I paid 50 or $60 for this. So, a little expensive for what you get. But, neat game. I think this one, Nonetheless. if you've subscribed to our channel, I did a review of Ranger not long ago. If you have any interest in that, go check that video out. Um, so this is an entirely unique uh, solo game. And that's because when you open it up, there's no counters whatsoever. Um, and it's, this Put you, is, make sure, it's a little unnerving. Yeah, you have a small deck <laughs> of cards, and some dice, and a pencil, and some pens. That's it. And it's a little bit like oh, this is like homework is the more game? than yeah more than playing right. <laughs> but it's this is a very it's a tactical game. Um, you'll choose your who's going to be in your squad, and the game is almost like a choose your own adventure style game. And whilst that is it's that's true to an extent, but it's not entirely true. I don't know if I have any of my maps. Okay, it's basically played on this glossy map, and the game is you will literally take a wet erase marker or dry erase marker. And I'm going to literally sit here and say, here's, here's the insertion point, here's what we're trying to go, we're going to set up a street ambush here, 
and then we're gonna exfil uh, we're gonna exfiltrate over here. And I will literally draw this map. Here's the route and the waypoints to get there, and here's to get out. When we cross this road, we're gonna stop and do a kind of a, a security check. Uh, then we're gonna cross this road. I'm gonna plan an alternate route. Here's where we're gonna meet up if things go hor horribly badly. And, and, and then, you, you literally carry this out. You will read through this huge book. With like a thousand entries, right? Yep, I mean, and it's just, it's a paragraph, number paragraph based system, and I start with paragraph one. And I will literally read it, this beautiful, luscious story, go to page 27. 27, you move silently through the water, you're in the middle of the boat, directly behind the navigator. I mean, it's just, it's so great. And, and at the end of that paragraph, this. you have choices. Yeah, and so then it's, you expend some time, there's a little time track, and you have to complete your mission within, you know, 12 hours or 24 hours or whatever. And then you go, you know, make a choice. Here, do you want to do this or do you want to do that? And then you get into the really cool stuff where it's like, um, if you're within X distance of this, or like, oh, if you've doubled back at, between mm -hmm. some point or other, like, you get ambushed. Then, yeah, you get ambushed because they saw you there and you're coming back again. The big no no. So there's some really cool military doctrine you need to get kind of down, but there's a book for that. They tell you in here, every, like, put this patrolling tactics. Here's how to set up a good ambush, here's what recon looks like. Here's a good marching pattern if you need to go and do something. So this will teach you tactical... Yes. Uh, yes. Some tactical strategy. This is, again, an entirely unique game. Unbelievably cool. This storybook is so well written. This, this tells one of the best solitaire stories. Uh, but one of the best narratives that I've ever seen in a game. Because that's what the game is. Mm -hmm. The planning is really cool. It was quite hard for me to learn because there's a lot to read because I have no military experience whatsoever. Um, so I had to kind of figure out what am I doing? Because the you know the first time I played, I was like straight line. Walk in a straight line. <laughs> let's, shortest let's shortest there. distance between two points is a straight line. <laughs> I don't want to miss that black hole picking me up. And then I watched some other people doing it, and they're just like, "Yeah, hey, I'm going to zigzag here, Corkscrew, I'm going to throw them off the yeah. sand, yeah. then we're going to do kind of this like split formation and come back." And so I'm like, "Ah, oh, these guys aren't doing." It. So there's a lot to kind of learn and figure out. But the more you play it, the more you're like, "Okay, this went horribly because I made a really bad planning decision, um, and that come back and bite you." But this is a really cool planning game, and the execution is just so much fun. Uh, very, very cool. So this game, game was designed by an ex-ranger, yes. right? Yes. So, was, so uh, really, it's kind of like ranger school. Oh yeah. Learning how to move and formations to use and different tactics. So I think that's kind of and a cool I don't, thing. I don't know if it's true. It was a. I don't know if it's apocryphal. I really hope that it, uh -huh. I like it that it is. But someone told me that that, that this game, it was. It was, they were told not to like give it to people going into ranger school because this would give them a better education than the actual ranger school. <laughs> I like to think that that's yeah, true right. that really happened. Um, I was told that by someone uh, who's a fan of this game. I'm like, man, I hope that's true. That's such a cool story. It's a really, really cool game. Um, this is, but it, it is kind of a step up. If you're new to solo war gaming, I'd recommend do a few other ones first. Got to figure out some tactics and stuff. And that's Ranger from Omega Games. Yes, it's but Omega it's out of Games. print. Right? It is. It, you can still get it. Get it. Um, I, but I believe the designer of this game passed away not too long ago. So Omega Games is kind of in, in a transitional phase. That's it might be slow getting it and being in contact with them. But if you can get it, get your hands on it. It's a fantastic game. I think we have. All right. Uh, there's <laughs> we got a few other things to talk about. So, oh, I got one more to go. We got some big GNT games. These are not solo games. Yeah, so they're not solitaire only solitaire design games. They're two player games yeah. that have been given a solitaire. And mode. these are both card driven games, which is not typically something I would look for in a solo game because the whole point of a CDG is that you get this cool hidden element. You have no idea what the enemy is mm. going to do because they've got this hand of cards you can't see. Well, this kind of takes that out of here. Labyrinth is neat. Uh, it organizes their cards, and there is a there's a decision matrix that you go through. Uh, it can be quite complex. There's a lot of things that you have to check, and because of how open ended and variable this game is, the game doesn't just say uh, is condition X met, is condition B met. It's a lot more involved than that. So you you're looking at numbers on the board, where they're placed on the board, who they're next to. So it, this it can be somewhat of a grind. 
trying to learn the solo system. Once you get it down, it's easy because you're checking the board for the same thing. Well, yeah. this situation hasn't changed, but learning it can be complex, and the game itself is very complex. This isn't this isn't necessarily an easy one to learn, and it's well, definitely the, the not the base an easy game, one to the master. two player game is not easy, and the solo game I think is even a little more difficult. Yeah, and and, and tactically, strategically speaking, you've got to put a lot of time into being good at this game. Yeah, it's hard to be good at this game. It's easy to learn it, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the game I think we've played probably second most in our collection. Yeah, we played that a lot. Second only probably to Combat Commander. But I, I love Labyrinth because it is such a difficult game. You are scratching and clawing for every inch of ground that you can gain. And guess what? That, that crazy jihadist can flip your plans yeah. on top of its head. And, and, and in the solo game, it's the same way. I feel like you're scratching and clawing for every piece of ground. In the solo game, it is you play as the US and the AI as the US. That's so the only way to do it. You yeah. can't do it the other way around. Otherwise, I think it would just be too complex. Yeah. I believe, I'm pretty sure that's how it is. That, that's a game I want to play more solitaire. I'd like to play it and even do a review, but I we just have so many games going on. But yeah. it, it, it's really neat, very well put together. And so the other one here is Empire of the Sun. This is almost, I don't want to say worse than Labyrinth, but like, this game is so big. And it's there's huge. so much in it. Playing it two player, this is one of the most complex games I've ever tried to learn. And the solo module to it can help you learn it, and it's it will never be quite as clever as, as a... As, as an actual... As me. It Let's can't be honest. Be as clever as me. Stuff. Just, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but the the solo bots, and this is the second edition that I've got, and it has the bots. It's called the Erasmus system. And I'm just going to show you because you can do it either side. So there is a there's a blue American Erasmus system, and it's these big cards with a ton of matrices and flow charts, and that's just a there's a lot. That's that's kind of thing. And then there's a Japanese one here. And there's the different matrices, there's, there's like three of these, there's kind of a, a like an early war and then like a late war kind of separation, so you'll kind of switch cards. But there's, it's just because this game is so big, you kind of, you have the cards, it's a card driven game, you kind of line them up in a certain way, and then it's like, um, you kind of choose a stance, which is based on what stage of the game there is, and how many victory points you might be in, in possession of, and then they're like, here's the strategy that you're going to pick. Based on this strategy, you're going to use this card. And with that card, you're going to do this thing because of that strategy that you chose. With that card, you're going to like, do the event or you're going to do the ops. Mm -hmm. If you do the ops, you're going to try to improve your position in some way. Here's what we're looking for first then second, then third, then fourth, choose the best one. And then you get into this whole other page of how to create the forces to do that. Again, a whole other decision to be made. And then you've got to get them there and then do the attacks. And then at the end, you've got to reassess everything to say, okay, we need to move back or keep things. Yeah, that's very involved. It's very, very involved. This is quite complex. So just if, if you're looking at solo war games and you haven't played a few, I would... Don't make this your first one, because this it, it, this burns your brain. Playing but, it two-player, playing but, it solo, you're just like... Oh. But with that being said, this is one of the games that we have extremely... You can see the rule book is just uh. trashed. <laughs> I think it has lunch on it and spilled drinks, but we've played this multiple times. I, I love it every time. I love it more every time. Oh, yeah. I, I learn more about the game every time. I'd love to try it solo. I have not done that only it's because huge. I would love to learn the game better. I feel like I end up doing the same two or three tricks every time and you foil them with your stupid interceptions and and you know but but those solo systems I think a lot of times the solo systems in the traditional two player games really help you learn the game and a this lot one, better. This one does that. It's just very hard. Yeah, very in depth. Systems. Very in depth. And this is a game that's huge and yeah, you know, it, inherently, any kind of a solo system is going to be imperfect. But I know Mark Herman's redoing it, and uh, in the third edition that's coming out soon, uh, you know, it's going to be much improved. So hope you know. I'm getting that third hopefully edition. Hopefully, it'll by be the way. more accessible. 
Yeah. But, it, you know, fantastic game. It's a massive game. And the solo system is like... Massive. Like, yeah. yeah. You've got to commit to it. And they put that in there because they know having an opponent for 12 hours it to play hard. this game is hard to do. Yeah. But me piddling and, around with that. In fact, we've boss. not been able to do a 12-hour <laughs> session. We can do four or five hours and our kids implode. You know, that's just the way life is. But... But yeah, those are those are kind of some um, multiplayer games which have a good solo. But the, uh, the other one, and this is just kind of a representative example, is Pendragon. So this is this is we'll say coin games. Volume eight. I think coin almost system. all the coin games. I think they retconned Andy and Abyss to have AI. I don't know if that's true. Did e they go back and make an AI for Andy and Abyss? Yes, they, it's like in C three I magazine. Okay. I think all of them now have a, an AI or, or a non-player option. So you can play them all solo. They have just charts for each one. Again... They're not as good solo, though. I'll, I'll no, just go up no. out and say that. You want to play this with, with four the players. maximum possible yeah. players that each game allows. Just, be, again, it's for that negotiation. The for alliance that teaming, building, uh, the backstabbing, all, the all the, all the interaction between those. Um, you'd lose that to an extent uh, with the solo bots, and it's also just a lot to manage. Yeah, I know you've played Liberty or Death Solo a few times, and you end up just scrapping the AI and just doing best possible. Movie, I, right? I think that has ha every time I've done that solo, I've played that game about eight times solo. I've started with the charts about halfway through the game. I'm like, ah, fooey with that. I'll just do the best choices. And I don't, I don't have Churchill as downstairs, but that's I feel the yeah. same way with that. Yeah, the, playing with Churchill, there's non-player bots. You can play it solo. It's fine. It's better with but three you, people. you want to play that with people, and I feel yeah. that way with the coin. Like, yeah. it's okay. The AI is fine. They're good, but I, I, this, is a, this is a multiplayer game, too. And, and I would say the AI are, is getting better. I, I think uh, they've done a lot more work in them, and, and, and now all games, I feel like, have an AI option or a solitaire option. It all, but they should. <laughs> because... We can't find com opponents, let's be honest. So, but yeah, coin game, good solo system. They're better. Yeah, I, if, you're, four, if you're buying four, it for three, a four. solo, if you're buying it as a solo game, I think you're missing out. Yeah. I genuinely feel that way. You want to buy that as a multiplayer game, and sometimes like, I'll set up solo. Yeah, but go ahead. Don't like cheat yourself of the coin experience, though. If you can only play solo, yeah. that's better than not playing the coin games. We love the coin games. We think they're fantastic. Um, I've got Comancheria. Ooh, Let this me. is a big one. Probably my favorite um, solo game that I have. So Comancheria, the rise and fall of the Comanche Empire. This is designed uh, by Joel Toppin from GMT Games. I absolutely love this game. I've played this game like five times now. I've only won once. The sign of a good solitaire. Yeah, the yeah. sign of a good solitaire. And I, actually, I remember playing it the first time and thinking, yeah, I'm doing pretty good. And then all of a sudden, the wave hit me. And it was like, oh... Now I understand, and so I learned. I think the third time I played it, I won, and then the fourth and fifth time I've gone on to the next level, and man, it gets harder. <laughs> but this is a fantastic game. You are controlling the Comanche uh, Indians, and you are fighting off all of their enemies, both, both settlers from America, the Spanish settlers coming in, um, other competing Indian tribes, and you're trying to survive. You're trying to preserve your culture. And it uses a fantastic AI system, and I'm not going to show you the board, because the board is huge, it's mounted, and I'm trying to... But the, the AI system is so fantastic, because I'm trying to see if I can find a graphic of it, well... Anyway, I'll, look at my review, it's, it's on, the, on the blog, but the AI system is so very cool, it's a, it's a chart, and each of the competing powers that you're fighting against has a column, and they have six or seven chits in that column. All of those chits represent their ability, their their actions that they can take from expanding or settling or going on the war path, etc. And they're going. You're going to do some rolling to decide which faction activates. You're then going to roll to see which actions they take, and then you're just going to use action points that you have generated for them through your actions. They're going to use those to to fuel their actions. So. The game really becomes an exercise in understanding, hey, the more I raid, the more I'm going to give more action points to my enemy, and they're going to dominate me. That's why I mentioned that wave that I talked about. I think my first time I played, I was gung-ho. I'm out there. I'm raiding all these villages, and all of a sudden, I looked down, and the guy had 15 points to use. 
which literally means he can do like six actions. So he was going to be do, doing raiding and killing me and taking my food. And it's just like, you can't play that way. So that AI system is absolutely fantastic. It resets itself. It's random, but it's also very well designed and just works very, very well. The, the system is very easy. You can only do four or five different actions. You're running around the board, expanding, building villages, collecting food, stealing horses and taking hostages, then trading those goods to get better goods and buying cards that improve your abilities. Really fantastic game, very interactive. You start to really care about your people. And when your people start, their villages start dying, you, you really start feeling. And I, I felt the desperate circumstances of the Comanche. And I think that's a really, in my opinion, what makes this game great from other solo, solitaire games that I've played. But the AI is fantastic, and it's just a really great design. Plus, it's a GMT game. The counters are fantastic, and it's just very well. Is that, uh, would you say well this is quite a complex game, though? This is complex. It is not going to be one you're going to sit down and understand immediately. And that's actually counterintuitive to whether I would like it or not, because I like to get down and play a game. This one took me, I had to go through the, the, the example of play two or three times. And, of course, the example of play does not give you the best strategies, right? It, it is simply trying to show you, ah, here's what you do. Here's how you do different things. So it took me a couple of tries to figure out, oh, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Joel Toppin did a great series of videos on YouTube that I would recommend you watch because he kind of takes you through some of the best practices, but he doesn't want to give you, he wants you to figure it out on your, your own. That's why he designed it the way he did. Um, but once again, after the third play, I finally won for the first time and it was like, <laughs> I did a war dance. I mean, it was, it was pretty crazy. Um, I, I finally won. Um, but very rewarding game, very engaging game, and a game that I think is very, lots of meaningful decisions. You have to make decisions at what point to replace your leaders who are getting older. You have to make decisions whether you raid, whether you trade, what cards you buy to improve your ability. There's a whole track of cards, seven or eight different types of cards that improve your abilities, and you can't be good at everything. So you really have to pick things that you think are going to work well. And I, I find that to be very, very fun. So I would definitely recommend giving this a, a try. He did a previous game um, on the Navajo. Um, yeah. It was called Navajo War or Wars. And it was done in, like in 2013. It's coming out on reprint probably next year, I hope. Um, but I definitely recommend Comancheria. Great game. So I think I've got here the last one that we'll talk about. This is Fields of Fire. This is the second edition. Uh, this is probably my favorite game from last year, and I actually don't, inside this, it's not inside this box, because there's too much. It comes in this nice two-inch box, and I've got it all in the big Which huge, is so odd, why they put it in a two-inch box. shoe box, because once you punch everything and keep it in the trays, it's huge. Um, so this is, this is a company game. You have like a, a infantry company, and you have um, three or four platoons, and within each platoon you'll have a few um, sections or teams. And you... The system is really cool. Uh, like we said with... Oh, wait, 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 wait. Uh, rifles in, rifles the in the Ardennes. It's this kind of abstract movement. This one, you know, you move through those sections. Well, Fields of Fire, you it's put cards, out... It's right? a, Yeah, it's a cards, and you have this World War II Northern France terrain deck. And you'll deal out cards in, like, this kind of square rectangle... And each of them has a terrain and a value for cover and, and a bunch of different things like that. And you're moving through terrains to try and f take an objective or, or to kill something. And as you move your guys, it triggers a bunch of um, enemy positions that open up that will then open fire on you. And, they, and the fields of fire, the name comes from... It's very easy to get caught in these crosshairs because there'll be like a machine gun nest over here. And it's literally aiming its gun this way. And if a sniper pops up here and pins you down, I mean, it's over. You, It's just brutal at times. Um, this game is, I would say, it's extremely complex. I think they have it They have it as a complexity six. And, and the I rule think, book is like I three inches that thick, is right? So yeah. It took me so long to learn this game. It is huge. And what I mean by that is, it's literally, the rule book is really, really thick. That there is so much detail from the left, from like, you know, you have all your different teams and squads, you'll literally deck them out with, this squad has some purple smoke and some yellow smoke that they can throw. 
And you have to plan before you attempt this mission, when they throw yellow smoke, here's what this means. This means that everyone behind this certain line, on this back line of cards, advances. Yeah. And you have to plan all that out, and understanding how the game works and what that stuff really means and the implications of that can be quite a challenge. Um, and and it's it, there's just a lot of um, kind of, I want to say, like jargon and terminology in the game that you kind of learn to get familiar with. And there's a lot of crunch, there's a lot of rules. You I mean, you've got to have field telephones and put out cables and wires between your teams and things like that to be able to communicate properly. There's just a lot of stuff in this. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. When you play this game, it, it feels like you're in a World War II movie. Like I moved my squads up, they flipped a counter, and there was a, there was an artillery spotter two cards away, and he dropped an artillery barrage right there and then. And my t my squad got white. It was it was awful. Mm -hmm. Like I immediately had two stretcher bearer counters, and I was like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it was like turn one. I was like, this is terrible because they just walked into a marsh. I don't know what I was doing. So there's just incredible level of detail and this game is huge I mean I think there's three campaigns there's World War 2 there's Korea and Vietnam. and Vietnam and one of those has at least two campaigns within that theater and there's a unique deck of cards for each of those um, campaigns and there's like eight or eight or ten missions or something within each of those campaigns so much game in this box unbelievable but don't make this your first Silent Hill game. <laughs> but if you've not played this and you've done some war gaming and you think you're into it, I this is a ten out of ten. I highly recommend this game. Tells a great story and gives you a lot of crunch and just full of this. This like this is purely tactical. So much decision making here. You make every decision basically, and that's awesome. I really, really, really like that in the game. So I think that. It's kind of a, I suppose, an update on our solo gaming, mm -hmm. but also a, a kind of look at the more complex end of the solitaire war gaming systems. There's a ton out there. Obviously, this is not any kind of an exhaustive list. There's a billion solo games. Send me all of your recommendations because I want to hear them because I'm going to play them all. Um, love solo gaming. It's something that I do in between when we're able to right, play. Just right. set a game up over the weekend or like during the week. Play a little bit here, play a little bit there. Yeah, that's what I've found is great about solitaire gaming. I can play during the week when I can't get with you. And I can set it up. I can play for an hour. I have to go do something. I come back later that night and finish. Or it goes over two or three days. I had Sherman Leader on my table, I think, for six weeks. <laughs> you just play, you know, play, 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 play it, play it. Played it for 45 minutes here, 45 minutes there. So a couple games that I'm looking forward to. Raiders of the Deep just came out from Compass Games. It is U-Boats in World War I. That's one I'm really desperately trying I'm trying to get my wife to uh, allow me to buy that. It's it's a continual struggle. Don't know that that's going to happen. Paisley, for watching, please. <laughs> um, Night Fighter uh, Ace is one that is coming out from Compass Games as well in May. It's the air war over over Germany during World War II. Desperately want to get that one. And then there's several reprints that I've got on P500. The Hunted... The Hunters. Yeah. You've got uh, Silent, got Victory. Silent Victory. Great fun game. Great yeah. narrative. Great story. And actually, just the other day on P500, they released one called The Med. Oh, Into the Med, cool. I think it's called. Hunter System, but it's in the Mediterranean, so it's Italian uh, subs. and so, so those are some of the games that I'm looking forward to. I'm not as big a solo gamer as Alexander. I would prefer we were sitting at a table playing... Because I like to do some banter and some, yeah. you know, saber rattling and some, you know, bluffing and that kind of thing. And you just don't, you don't get that in solo gaming. It's just not really part no. of it. And the one thing I, the one game that I've like had my eye on for a long time is, it's uh, called Mr. President. Yes. And, not, and I don't think it's, it's not a war game per se. No. You are the president and you are literally running the country. So you've got to take care of like foreign yeah. affairs, yep. economy, social things, politics, all yep. this kind of stuff. That looks fascinating and i know that uh they've been working on that GMT, game for a yeah. really long time and it's i don't know if they're love. hoping it's going to be this year I've, or not, I've, but i'm hoping it's going to yeah, be this year but it does look cool that, just something that's very different and that's what i also that's what i love in a solo game is a clever solo game something yeah. that's unique something that's got a cool system that's going to show me something new that's what i want in a good solo game that's why i'm looking forward to that one yeah but yeah that's kind of just a look at some of the heavier end of the solo gaming systems and, and different games that you can look at there. Again, 
any recommendations, wing them my way, and I'll probably look them up. Um, appreciate you watching. I've been Alexander. And I'm Grant. And we're the